Shalom, Ruchim Abayim, and welcome to Shevet Impani of the Torah to 70 Faces of the Torah and also Sulam Yaakov. This week's Torah portion is Parashat Kitavo. Kitavo in Hebrew means when you enter, which is a reference to Hashem addressing the Jewish people upon entering Eretz Israel or what we call the Promised Land. I have subtitled this teaching, Serving Hashem in Joy. In fact, the subtitle is borrowed from the very beginning of Tehillim 100 or Psalm 100, in which there David the Melech says, Eve duet Adonai besimcha, that we should, should excuse me, serve Hashem in joy. <clears throat> now, in this week's Torah portion, we encounter a unique set of mitzvot. However, really, it can be summarized between what we would consider the blessing and the curses of the Torah. And so we encounter at the very beginning of the Torah portion what is known as Bikurim, okay? Mikra Bikurim, which is the announcing of the first fruits. Follow behind that is what's called Vidui Maaserot, which is the confession of tithes. So you have the Maser Sheni, the second tithe, and then there's also the Maser Oni, which are tithes that were reserved for the poor or for the orphan, also for the Ger, which is the convert things of that nature. From there, the Torah then transitions into talking about the blessing and the curses of the Torah. Now, the blessings and the curses of the Torah, they really serve as the renewal terms of the covenant between Hashem and the Jewish people. In fact, we take a look here in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 69. The Torah says, Eli Adonai et Moshe that these are the words of the covenant that Hashem commanded Moshe to seal with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, because this is where they have been dwelling, okay, until Yehoshua succeeds Moshe and then leads the children of Israel uh, across from the Jordan to conquer the city of Jericho. And it says, besides the covenant that he sealed with them in Horev. Now, Horev is another name for Mount Sinai. What does this mean? A lot of times when people read this passage and they don't have any former recollection of how the Parshiot are integrated to each other and the events that are laid out of the Jews' journey in the wilderness, they tend to think that these are somewhat separate covenants. They are not. Essentially, there's the same covenant. However, there's a renewal being done here. So after the sin of the Egel Zahav, or what we call the Golden Calf, Hashem added curses to the Torah. In fact, if you go back to Parashat Bechuchatai, Vayichor Leviticus chapter 26, 14, there the Torah talks about what's called the Tochacha, are these seven levels of rebuke that would increase in a greater capacity if the Jewish people failed to do a Shuvah. In fact, the consequences of violating the Torah as it's described back in Parsha B'chukatai, and even to a degree Parsha Bahar, and when we get to the laws of Shemitah, the Evet Ivri, Yovel, things of that nature, eventually they come to pass in the days of Yirmiyahu Hanavi, the days of Jeremiah, and which eventually the kingdom of Israel uh, was eventually severed from the south of Judea, and they were exiled by Ashur or Assyria, which was sent at Cherif, and then eventually Nebuchadnezzar was used as an instrument in the hand of Hashem to conquer uh, the Jews in Judea and carry them off to Babel in exile. And so as you read the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel is recorded studying the passages of Jeremiah, trying to figure out when the Galut, the exile, would end because it was only supposed to be 70 years, considering that Hashem taxed on an additional year for every time the Jews violated the laws of Shemitah, However, Daniel was informed by the Malach that your people are not Zohe, they're not worthy to come out of the Galut, so the Galut continues to Gilgal, it rolls on. And so from there, we of course go from Bavel to Madai, which is the whole scenario with uh, Porim, Esther, Mordecai, and then eventually from there we encounter uh, the Greek Empire, and eventually the history of the Chashmonaim and Hanukkah, and while that's a very celebratory uh, event in Jewish history, it, it actually comes on the 
a precipice of great darkness after the Hashmonaim had an eternal fighting and eventually a peace party with Rome and eventually the rise of the Herodian family and many of the events that took place 2,000 years ago and the revolutionary wars uh, that the Jews had, specifically the northern Jews from the Galil, uh, the Zealots, the uh, Sikharin, the Assassino Jews, that led to the great revolt against Rome in the year 66, which led to the destruction of the temple. And from that point on to this present day, we are in what's considered the Galut of Roma, is the, uh, the exile of Edom, okay? Even though there is a Medina of Israel, a state of Israel, there are about 8 million Jews living over there. We're still in Galut. The current modern state of Israel is not based upon the constitution of the Torah. It's a democracy. And no, it's not like the United States. America is a constitutional republic. There's a difference between a democracy and a constitutional republic. So aside from that, many of the events that have happened have been consequences for failing the Torah. And so when you look back through the pages of Jewish history, you see that the curses that the Torah talks about in this week's Torah portion are basically amplifying, I would say, ad-libbing based upon what was already mentioned back in Parsha B'chukatai. And so if you count the curses in this week's Torah portion, they enumerate a total of 98 curses. Okay, and once again, they are an extension of what you find in the Tochacha back in Parsha B'chukatai. Now the Torah tells us that the curses um, that befall a person, it's, it happens because a person did not serve or does not serve Hashem with simcha, with joy. For example, here towards the concluding remark of the curses of the Torah in Deuteronomy 28, 45 to 47, it says, ko hakalalot. All of these curses, they will come upon you Okay, and not just come upon you, but they will also, they will also, or da fucha, there will be a pursuit of you. They will pursue you, and once they pursue you, they're going to, vehisigucha, they're going to overtake you until chasis chalila, you are destroyed. Why is that? Because it says, kilo shomata beko adonai alohacha. Because you did not listen to the voice of Hashem, your God, lishmor mitzvotav, to observe His commandments, v'chukotav, and His decrees, asher sivach, that He commanded you. And then it says, v'hayu v'cha le'ot. They will be an ot, which means they will be a sign. Umofet, they will be also a wonder. Okay, which is like a, a, a signature in a sense, something that's unique by divine design. And it says, not just in you, but also, but also in your descendants forever. Meaning that these things that will come upon you will not just be limited to your lifetime, but also, God forbid, they will extend into your descendants' lifetime and your descendants' descendants. And that is something that has been going on for several thousand years. The verse then concludes, Because, this is happening to you because you did not serve Hashem, your God, your power, in joy and in goodness of heart, when everything was abundant, everything was Good, everything was very abundant. Interesting, <clears throat> excuse me. Now when you look at this passage and you think about it and you ponder uh, what it's saying, the question that comes up is, how does a lack of joy lead to a person experiencing the curses of the Torah? Joy is an emotion and for some people, when you go through trials and you go through tribulations, you go through hardships, it's not always easy to uh, engender the feeling of simcha, nachat, any type of joy or happy expression. So, I mean, the Torah is being for real here that all of these, these, uh, these curses are happening because of a lack of joy? How does that even happen? Well, if we delineate to a few Mepharshim rabbinical commentaries, we see that the rabbis discuss why it's important to have joy. 
uh, specifically, and I don't have the passage on the screen, from Chazal, in which they say the Shekhinah does not dwell upon a person unless they have joy. The Or HaChaim, in his commentary, he explained that our failure to perform the mitzvot with Simcha is what leads to the curses of the Torah. And this is what he brings out to Deuteronomy 28, 47. He says this uh, onizze, this, this punishment, and all that follows it, until the statement in verse 58, are for, excuse the typo there, neglecting the fulfillment of mitzvah obligations. So in Hebrew, he's talking about mitzvah ase, which are positive commandments, which the Torah indicated in the verse, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, that says over there, if you do not listen to the voice of Hashem, your God, to tishmur la'asot, to perform all of his commandments, it therefore says at the beginning of the list of this punishment, because you did not serve Hashem your God, meaning that you failed to serve Him by fulfilling the mitzvot that He commanded you to do with joy and goodness of heart when everything was good. Therefore, you will serve your enemies whom Hashem will send against you. And once again, history speaks for itself. The Babylonians, the Romans, the Greeks, etc. Okay? And also throughout the ages of the past thousand years, even in our modern day life, Hashem can send enemies against us. It could be your boss, it could be a rival at work, it could be uh, economic difficulties, it could be a president, it could be a prime minister, and for some of you folks out there, it could even be your mother-in-law. It says, Hashem will send against you, and hunger and thirst and nakedness without anything. The Or HaChaim goes on to conclude. Furthermore, because you cast off the yoke of the mitzvah from upon you, your enemy will put an iron yoke on your neck until he destroys you. These punishments are mita kenega mita. They're measure for measure for casting out the yoke of mitzvah obligations. Once again, for performing positive mitzvot. This is also the meaning of verse 49 that says, You who do not wish to trouble yourselves to understand and clarify the proper manner of performing the mitzvot, Hashem will carry against you a nation from afar, a nation whose language you will not understand. And just for a side note here, that passage that the Or HaChaim is alluding to, I did not really spend adequate time to go into that for this teaching. I wanted to keep it brief, since I had limited time this week in preparing a teaching, is that when it talks about a nation from afar whose language you didn't understand, that is speaking about the current exile that Israel is in today, which has been ongoing for the past 2,000 years, which is the Bene Romi, okay, which are the Romans, okay, whose language is Latin, okay. They came like an eagle representing a Nesher, okay, and though they didn't use military force to conquer the Jews, they entered via a peace treaty, due to the political turmoil that was happening with the Hashemunah family. And so they kind of were able to backdoor their way into Israel and then subvert that coalition they formed and eventually uh, annex and tax Judea. And then they also had uh, uh, re basically uh, revolutionary issues with the Galilean Jews from the north, okay, in the form of like guerrilla warfare. So nonetheless, Ramban in his commentary explains in very, very great detail that when the Torah mentions Hashem bringing the enemy from afar and carrying you off to exile, it's the Romans. The Romans, yes, once they came to Israel and if they fought you in any form of war before the great revolt took place and eventually they slaughtered any Jew in their path, they would eventually conquer any Jew in war, like specifically from the Zealots, okay, the Essene movement. They would take them captive as a Roman prisoner schlepped them over the Mediterranean to the island of Sardinia and in there there was four Jewish slave towns and then eventually you were now put into the service of Madre Roma, okay, a mother Rome in which you were to be served as a slave and a prisoner, okay, and so you were used even for their military. This is also what happened to Josephus, the Jewish historian as well, instead of basically dying, he became used as an instrument for the, for the Flavians. And that's the history within itself, which is another topic for another day to get into. So concluding here, the Or HaChaim says, this, the same applies to all of the curses contained in this section. They are measure for measure for neglecting mitzvah obligation in 
joy. And this is very, very important what the Or HaChaim is saying there. Specifically, it's not just negligence of, uh, of, uh, of, of mitzvot aseh, of positive commandments, but it's a lack of joy when doing those mitzvot. Rabbi Bachaya, in his commentary, he expounded upon this concept and he explained that we are not obligated to perform mitzvot simply to fulfill the letter of the law. Rather, we must have joy when we perform the mitzvot. Rabbi Chai here to Deuteronomy 28, 47. He says, the Torah accuses people who do not, and there's a type of that, who do serve God, do not serve God joyfully. And excuse me, I was you know, kind of in a rush typing everything, so I apologize there about the grammatical errors. So he's saying from the Hebrew, the Torah accuses people who do not serve Hashem joyfully. A person is obligated not merely to carry out, pay attention when he says, not merely to carry out God's instructions, but to do so gladly in a happy frame of mind. Joy when performing any of God's mitzvot is considered as fulfillment of a mitzvah by itself, meriting additional schar or reward. This is why one may be punished for failing to perform the mitzvot without a joyful heart. Not with a joyful heart. Once again, there's a typo. I do apologize. I had limited time this week to get this teaching together. So one could be punished for failing to perform the mitzvot, okay, without a joyful heart. Powerful. Powerful. What Rabbi Bachai is saying over here, that we're not just to merely follow God's instructions, not meant to just merely perform a mitzvah, okay? The Torah stated that prior to experiencing the curses of the Torah, the people experience an abundance of God's blessings, that everything was everything was good. The people were blessed, a great bracha hatzlacha, a great blessing and success. And even though they had this great abundance, the Torah says they didn't have joy. They failed to serve Hashem when everything was merocho, okay? They had no utuv levav, they had no you know, basically in the goodness of heart was lacking. So they experienced everything was good. Finances were good. Business was good. Everything was good. Everything was copacetic. But yet they didn't serve Hashem during this time with joy. So they had everything. The bills are paid. Their economy is good. Everything is going good for them. But there's no joy. The key to experiencing the blessing of the Torah is not to perform mitzvot by appearing religious. Instead, we must perform the mitzvot in joy. Hashem does not desire for us to observe the Torah mechanically. He doesn't want robots. He doesn't want people punching the clock of the Torah like it's a nine to five job in which they go in and they go through emotions. Over at Sefer Yeshayahu, it mentions how Hashem placed a ruach tardema, a deep spirit asleep upon the Jewish people because their observance of the Torah was superficial. We read here in Isaiah 29, 10-14. It says, Ki For Hashem has poured upon you a spirit of deep sleep et enechem et hanevi'im and He has closed your eyes the prophets, ve'et rashechem, your heads, ha'chozin kisa, who stargaze, they have been covered. Now the background to this, for those who don't know, just to give a little brief explanation, is that Hashem is very displeased with the people, okay, at this time. And, and so eventually the people, the sages, the leaders of Israel in those days, that while they were somewhat knowledgeable in the Torah, they felt that they had mastered the entire system of spirituality. And because the leaders of the Sanhedrin, they were able to study the secrets of astronomy and astrology. One of the things that members of the Sanhedrin had to be skilled in, especially when combating any of the dark forces and powers out there, um, because they felt they were able to study and to discern and to decipher many things in creation, 
as somehow they, they had all the life figured out. And so it's at this point in which Hashem is responding to the arrogance of the people and their connection to Him that He says, I'm going to cause a spirit of deep sleep. You're going to become spiritually narcoleptic, okay, which means that your leaders, your prophets, etc., they won't be able to decipher the secrets of creation like they used to. He goes on to say afterwards, and also, and the vision of everything has been to you like the words of a sealed book, which they give to one who can read, saying to that individual over there, hey, listen, I need you to, uh, I need you to read from this for me. And rather they say, I cannot read because it's sealed. And then the book is given to one who cannot read, saying afterwards the same thing to them, listen, um, go ahead and read. And that individual then responds to them afterwards, saying, Lo yadati sefer. You know, basically, I can't read this book. I don't have the ability to. I just can't read. I'm illiterate, right? So it goes on to say afterwards, Avayomar Adonai, Ya'anki nigash ha'am bifi. And the master said, these people draw near with their mouth and their lips, they honor me. However, he says, many, but their heart is distant from me. Oti, and their fear of me, their reverence of me. It says, Misfat Anashim Melumada is the observance through sheer force of habit. Now I know in many translations will say is the observance of commandments of men. And that's how you could literally translate it, but that's not the way it's understood when translating it. Which is why, if you take a look at my translation, Misfat Anashim Melumada means that it's man, not just a teacher, but it's the, a, a custom of a person to do things via by habit, sheer force of habit. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. The verse then goes on to conclude here. Lachen hineni yosif lechafli. Therefore, I will continue to perform obscurity at Ha'am ha Hazay to this people. And then it emphasizes, it says, Hafle vafele, obscurity upon obscurity. Literally, it's a double sense of being obscure that God is going to put upon the people via this deep sleep that they will have. And then it says afterwards, and the wisdom of his wise men shall be lost. Fascinating. When Hashem said that He would continue to cause this obscurity to befall the people, it says, Yosef lehafli et ha ha'am hazeh. This increase, this Yosef, okay, of this obscurity. It's without any coincidence that we find in this week's Torah portion that a part of experiencing the curse of the Torah is obscurity. Things will be concealed from us. Deuteronomy 28, 58 through 59. If you will not be careful to perform all the words of this Torah that are hakituvim basefra hazay that are written in this book, so when you just read in Isaiah, they say they gave the book that is that is sealed, and the person says, "I don't lo yadati I don't know anything. I can't read it." Which book are they talking about? They're talking about the Torah, and which a person could be a melamdim, someone could be learned. But yet they can have ruach tuma, a deep spiritual slumber that blocks their perception from being able to discern, to be able to comprehend and understand the actual word of God. That's what it's saying. And so we already had the warning here in this week's Torah portion before it became actual uh, manifestation of the consequence of the sins of the people. Therefore, if a person is not careful, what's written here to do what? To Lehira, what did God just say in Isaiah? I'll bring it back for you guys. That they, he says that their vadhira tam oti, their reverence of me, their fear of me, is sheer form of habit. Go back to the verse, and it says over here, if you fail the et Hashem hanichbad v'hanora, this awesome name, okay, Hazayat Hashem Elohecha, Hashem your God, your power, then what's going to be the consequence? It says in yellow. Then Hashem will obscure. See what it says there? 
What did God just say at the end? Lachen hineni Yosef lehafli et ha'ahaze. I will continue to perform obscurity to this people. Hafle vafele, obscurity upon obscurity. That was already written many, many hundred years ago via Moshe Rabbeinu. God says, Hashem will obscure your afflictions, not just yours, ve'et machot za'echa, and the afflictions of your children. Machot girulot ve'ne'emanot. These will be great and faithful. It's called faithful afflictions. Why? Because God is faithful in everything that He does. Vachalim ra'im ve'ne'emanim. And evil and faithful, God forbid, chalim, sickness, illness. And of course the Torah goes on there to Hashem saying, yeah, all of the sickness of Mitzrayim that I put upon the Mitzrayim, I'll bring upon your tuchas. This is why tragically and sadly, when you do look at many of the events that have transpired in the, the bloody pages of Jewish history, these are without a shadow of a doubt the curses of the Torah. They are what happens to a person as a consequence, not just to an individual, but the collective arm as well, in different geographical locations. These are the words set in stone that have concretized throughout time because of the disobedience of the people. And Isaiah, once again, there's the emphasis on the people experiencing obscurity. Hafle vafele. Now, I didn't have it on the screen, I didn't get time to show it on the PowerPoint, but the root word there, pala, from lahafli, it means wonder, like in the micha mocha fele, okay, nora, Hashem's works are marvelous, they're awesome. It means wonder. However, pala also refers to an event that could be difficult to understand, just like it could be something positive, like when the Jews crossed the Yam Suf, and they broke out with the Micha Mocha, Ba'alim Adonai, who is like you amongst all the powers. Okay, your ways are mar oh, marvelous. Okay, is awesome, right? We can't understand how the, um, the Yam split. We don't understand the logic in that, but it happened. We experienced it. Well, vice versa, just as the Jews experienced the positive outcome of the, of the Yam splitting, the Mitzrim experienced the negative part. Because they were the individuals who went to pursue the Jews and the water just psh, collapsed on them and Zagazut, they were gone. So, Pala refers to an event that's difficult to understand. As part of the curse of the Torah, Hashem was telling the people, both in Isaiah and here in Parashat Kitavo, that when they experience tribulations, when they experience hardships, it's going to be very difficult for them to understand why are these things happening to them. Put it in modern terms, person gets laid off, massive inflation or deflation, the Fed will pivot, this is going to happen, who knows, economically. A person's uh, material assets are basically being flushed away. Why is this happening to me? person goes to get a checkup done, they're not feeling good, doctor says, listen, get your house in order, you have uh, X amount of days to live. Why is this happening to me? Many of these things just come from out of nowhere and someone's trying to basically figure out the formula I, I can't understand. Why is this happening to me? This is what the Torah is saying. The consequence of serving Hashem without simcha is what causes the curses of the Torah. In Isaiah, Hashem said the people only revered Him out of what? Mitzvat anashim melumanda, out of sheer force of habit. Rabbi Avraham even Ezra explained that the word melumanda can actually mean a custom. A custom, as he says here, they became a custom, which is the root word lamad, which means to learn, and also limud is to learn, lamad means to teach, where you get the word tamid, or tamu for limud, which is which means to study, like tamu Torah. They became a custom to performing the mitzvah without a force of habit, without thinking to do God's will. I mean, how does that really work? Thinking without doing God's will, like you just do it without, what he's saying here is that, People just are religiously programmed to follow Allah Big Yemul without a personal connection to Hashem. Also, you see here in this quote, Rabbi Avraham Ibn Ezra, he cross references a verse over in um, Jeremiah, specifically in Jeremiah chapter 31 18. And in that verse, it describes Ephraim, which is just another name for Israel crying out to Hashem to be saved. And what's interesting is in that verse, Israel 
confesses to Hashem that they are like a calf that has never learned. We see here in Jeremiah 31, 18, Shamu shamati Ephraim. God says, I hear Ephraim doing what? Meet no day, lamenting. And what is Ephraim, what is Israel saying? Yesartani excuse me, va'ivaser ke'egel, you have punished me. I am punished like an ego, like a calf. Lo lumad, it says there. And the translation I put there is, has not learned. Some translations will say, like a calf that has been shattered. Uh, not really accurate where they get that concept from. Like, shever is not, not there in Hebrew. Lo lumad means not learned. Not learned. Hashivenu va'ashuva, receive me back. Let me return, for you, Hashem, are my God. So what does this mean? Well, because Israel became so accustomed to serving Hashem out of habit, they never learned the proper way to serve Hashem from their heart with joy. The Radach, Rabbi David Kimchi, in his commentary, I didn't get a chance to put it on the screen, on this very verse from Isaiah 29.13, he, he explained, that the people did not go further than the letter of the law. So that meant that their performance of the mitzvah was not based on a genuine desire to know Hashem. A genuine desire to know Hashem. So in regards to Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra's cross-reference here to Isaiah 29, 13, with Jeremiah 31, 18, when it mentions that Israel is punished like a calf, lo luma that has not learned. If you think about the arrogance of an animal, right that could be stubborn that could be wild that any animal that becomes uh, that's not disciplined let's say like a chazir right even though they're not kosher to consume but one that goes rogue in the wilderness becomes a boar right it undergoes a complete dramatic transformation and same thing with other wild animals israel when they lack the discipline of properly connecting to hashem even if they're observing a mitzvah here and observing a mitzvah there by the letter of the law they become accustomed to a certain habit, which means lolumad. They haven't properly learned the commandment in its essence. That's what Rabbi Avraham Ibn Ezra is trying to say when he mentions that the whole concept um, here in Isaiah refers to mitzvah uh, anashim milumada, is that Israel became accustomed to performing the commandments out of habit. They never learned the right way, like an animal. When it comes to our service of Hashem, we need to learn to appreciate the real value of what we are doing and understand how it should be properly done. In Parsha Achremot, Hashem said that we shall live by His mitzvot. Vayichra, Leviticus 18.5 It says, You shall observe my decrees and my laws, which man shall carry out, and by which he shall live, I am Hashem. Now this phrase here, v'chai bahem, does not simply mean live by them. Rather, v'chai bahem, literally means you shall live in them. Meaning you shall find your life in them, in the mitzvot, in the mishpatim, in the chuchim, the two different categories that basically make up the 613 commandments. As a result of learning Torah, there is a dimension of energy and life that is to become injected into us. When there is simcha, genuine joy in what we're doing, then what we're doing has an energy that is able to transform us. Therefore, mitzvah anashim milumada is a condition and quality of performance of Hashem's Torah. Vachai Bachem is a challenge to how we engender God's Torah within us. Anybody could do a commandment. Anyone could look religious. It's really easy. It's institutionalized religion when people do that. Mitzvah Anashim Milumada means we are guilty of robbing the Torah of the energy that it's supposed to instill in us. Think about that. Especially as we are getting ready to come to the end of the year, Okay, since we're, you know, only weeks away from Rosh Hashanah. We're getting ready to come to the end of the year, 
and hopefully everyone is preparing for their intimate rendezvous with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We need to determine how are we going to approach Hashem. Are we going to stand before Hashem like we normally do every time the holidays come around? Are we simply going to go through the motions, flipping through the pages of Sadur, do the Vidui, do the Alchet, do, you know, do all the motions, beat the chest, say the confession, right? Give a couple extra dollars of Sadaka. Are we going to continue to go through the motions? Are we going to ask Hashem for another year of life and blessing, even though we are guilty of misappropriating our performance of Hashem's Torah? Now, don't get me wrong. This doesn't mean that we're energetic beings. Okay? I want to make sure people understand that. I'm not accusing anyone of not putting enough effort, okay, and, 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 and having their fair share of schwitzing through you know, their own personal tikkun. Hashem told Israel, Ahar Sinai, right before giving the Torah, that the primary function of this nation is that they are supposed to be a mamlech chonim for goy kadosh. That they are to become a kingly nation, a priest. To become. It's a process, which means nothing happens overnight. We're all in the process. The problem with the process is when we become stagnant, when we get stuck. And as we get ready to enter to the holidays, the primary theme is teshuva. Teshuva, friends, contrary to how you may have been taught by your rabbi or whoever, is not simply doing a bunch of religious things to appear religious. Teshuva literally means to return. It's like a restoration point. Returning back to a point of what you were originally designed for in this world. What is your mission here? Okay, what talents and gifts has Hashem given you to actually do what you need to do in this world before your time is up here? In the very beginning of the Torah portion, when the Torah addresses the subject of Maserot, specifically with the first of, of tithes, which is Bechorim, first fruits, and I have a separate teaching on this alone, which is very, very interesting, but for time, uh, you know, basically constraints this week. I wasn't able to really tap into this Torah portion as much as I'd like to, even though I have the teaching available for another time. In the very beginning of the Parsha, the Torah commands that we are to be joyful for everything that Hashem has done for us and for our families. We see here in Leviticus 26, verse 11, it says, V'samach d'becho hatov. There it is again. You shall rejoice. Not just rejoice, but you shall have joy. With all the goodness that Hashem your God has given you and your household. Your household is your family, by the way. It's your wife and your kids. Not just with them, but also with the Levi, who you would give your tithes to, because they were the ones who didn't have inheritance. So the teachers of the Torah, the people would tie to them. In the sense of bringing uh, produce, not just fiscal notes, okay, or Bitcoin. They didn't have that. They had bitachon to bring their gold coins and to exchange for carbonote and things of that nature. Anyway, if you get to play on words, bitachon, Bitcoin, etc. Not only that, but the ger who's in your midst. And the ger is also important because they're not just a non-Jew anymore. They're a Jew. And as somebody who comes from a background of, of paganism or whatever non-Jewish society they lived in, uh, they don't have a sharehold. They don't have. They don't have inheritance. They're like the Cohen. They don't have any ancestral land. It won't be until their third generation uh, descendant that comes from them eventually that they're fully assimilated into Eretz Israel and to the people of Israel, and eventually have some type of uh, nachala, some type of inheritance there. So we see here that with joy, you're supposed to rejoice, and the blessing that God gives you. Is also supposed to be shared. This is also the meaning behind the Ve'ahavta. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha b'chol levavcha u'v'chol nashacha u'cho me'odecha. You shall love Hashem your God with all of your hearts. Not heart, but hearts. It's in a plural. Your yetzer tov, your yetzer hara. Both inclinations. Okay, with all your soul, your life force, and me'odecha. Which means abundance, but is a reference to your finances. You're supposed to serve and love Hashem with everything. One says, oh, I love Hashem, right? Uh, I, I, I love Hashem. I love you, Hashem. Ani ohev Hashem. What does love mean in Hebrew? The word ahava is from the root word hav, which means to give. If you love something, you love someone, you give them something. 
time, energy, whatever. So we see here the Torah goes into great detail. And like I said, it's a separate subject to get into to break down, which is very, very interesting to understand Becharim and Maserot and to understand that. But we see that the Torah requires the Jewish people upon entry into Eretz Israel and every year after that as they are in the land, that the Jews are required, required to appear before the Kohen. They're required to announce vows in the first year of the first fruits and then in the second or third year when it comes to Maser Sheni or the Maser Oni. Okay? They, they have to give these vows. Why? The vow is to remind the individual of his natural origin and national mission. The humble times of what Uncle Levan did to my great-great-great-grandfather, Yaakov Avinu. And so it reminds them of their humble beginnings and also the mission. Going to Israel is not a national, a national country club of Israelis. That's not how that works. The vows of Bikurim and Maaser demonstrate our gratitude of possessing Eretz Israel and for the material wealth that is derived from it. The land and its produce is the foundation of Israel's national existence. And so we see here is that on a very pashat, a very literal level, when a person is required to give to Hashem, they're required to give. I could spend a whole hour on this topic, but I don't have time, so please forgive me. But we just got done learning here that the curses of the Torah happen when we don't serve Hashem with joy. So the Torah decides to entertain the, uh, a specific mitzvah that's connected with that concept, and that's the mitzvah of maser, of tithing, of donating, giving sadaka, okay? giving one's first fruits of whatever they make. And while I don't have all the information on the screen to share with you, Chazal Tal's tithing begins by separating. That when a person will go out to their field, and specifically the mission tells us there were seven unique uh, uh, plants, seven, seven unique seeds that would grow in the land that were Subject, uh, su subjected to being tied, okay, for Bechorim. And so you can extend that idea and you can also take it to your day in life today because no one tithes like they did back in the day. We have a Behamikdash, you know, things will happen. So we still have the idea of how we donate and how we give to other forms of, uh, of Torah learning, whether it's Yeshivot or things of that nature, humanitarian causes. Uh, we do those things. Bechorim, etc. So, in a sense, a person was required to give. So, let's say, perfect example, the world is going through uh, an uncertain time of inflation. People are like, I don't, I, it, this is, I don't understand. How is this happening to me? Why The stock market is drying up. What's happening to my real estate property? You know, how many people were flocking to South Florida during the year and then they realized they were paying exuberant amount of money on the homes and commercial businesses and he realized now Florida's entering into, uh, into the red, okay, and they have a lot of vacancies in the homes, meaning that people still have another home back up north because they're, they, they, they can't pay two mortgages at the same time. They're having a hard time. So, you know, what's going on here, right? Individuals are struggling. Why is this happening? Well, what's that? You know, we start blaming politicians, blaming this and that. Instead of recognizing that Hashem is the one who controls everything. A person's having a struggle with their health, the whole shtuyot with the, the, you know, the Wuhan, Wu flu thing still going on and all the other things that have evolved from it, you know, what they claim evolved from it. So people are like, what's going on? Why is this happening? And the Torah comes along and says, hey, you, you know, remember your humble beginnings, you're required to give to Hashem. Give. Chazal says a person was required back in temple times to separate. That's when their tithing began. Not just getting it. And they also said a person was never to decide their tithes by calculation. Not to sit there and say, let me break my bills down. I have this do, that do. No, nope, a person automatically put their tent away. This goes to HaKadosh Baruch Okay? This is Chakdish. This is a sanctified donation. This goes to the temple. That's what that does. The Mishnah comes along, a Perkei Avot, and tells us that everything that we have is not ours. It's Hashem's. It belongs to him. We read here in Perkei Avot 37. Rabbi Elazar Ish Bar Tota, the leader of Bar Tota. He says, Ten lo mishelo 
Give God what is His. By what? By giving of yourself and your possessions to do His will. Because you and what belongs to you are really His. You don't own anything. So when people are coming around saying, yeah, I'm going to own a house. You don't own nothing. <laughs> Especially if you're still forced to pay tax property on your home. And that the fact that you could live in it for 80 years, die, and there's some, some young chutzpah will come along and live in it after you. You never owned it in the first place. That's the placebo. It's the illusion. Same thing with anything else in this world. So the Mishnah says, everything that belongs to you really belongs to him. He's just lending it to you. For what? To actually allow you to fulfill the purpose of what he brought you into this world for. We find here in the prayer stated by Dava Hamelik, the Mishnah goes on and says, from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 14, it says, Ki mimecha hako umiyadecha natanu lach. Since everything is from you, it is from your hand that we have given to you. What that means is that everything that we have, we give back to you. What does that actually mean? It actually means that whatever talents and gifts Hashem has given you, you are actually supposed to use for Hashem. You have to refrain from using your own talent, your money, resources for selfish indulgences. Rather, because everything belongs to Hashem, you are required to give it to Him. Which means if God gives you a brain like Einstein or Nikola Tesla, you need to use it for Him. Okay? Uh, via the realm of the Torah, right? Everything is done to Him. God's giving you the voice of a, of a singer, you need to use it for Him. God's giving you amazing athletic skills, you need to use it for Him. Everything is to be for Him to help guide and lead people to the direction of focusing on God. So what we see here in conclusion of this teaching is that if we don't use the gifts, the talent, the resources, time, energy, whatever, okay, with joy when it comes to serving Hashem, then you can rest assured that you eventually will experience, God forbid, the curse of the Torah. And once again, the Torah highlights when everything was merov chol, when everything was good, your economy was booming, your family was good, your health was good, you had all this, and yet you still didn't serve Hashem with joy. And so as a consequence for that, now you're going to experience the curse of the Torah. That's a consequence. It's not a punishment. It's not God saying, oh, I'm going to teach you a lesson or two, that you had millions of dollars and you didn't share any with me. I mean, what's your money going to do to Hashem? Nothing. As I explained in previous teachings, the mitzvot of the Torah that they're given to us are for purifying our heart. That's why, as I explained in last week's parsha in Kitasa, they called it the attribute of compassion, in which the Ramban and Rambam were basically, you know, having a a breakdown about the significance, the meaning of the commandments. Does it matter whether we perform shechita on animal from the front of the neck or the back of the neck? What does it matter to God? It's what matters to God for the benefit of us that the mitzvot are meant to purify our hearts. And so it's the same thing. As we get ready to enter into the new year. I think some of us should step back and get into a great realm of introspection and basically see how has our performance of God's Torah been. Once again, we're all a work in progress, beyond a shadow of a doubt. But we have to recognize that everything God has given us is His. We need to give it to Him. Which means everything that comes to us is from His hand, we return it back. That includes the neshama. Okay? The neshama. Eventually, when a person is done in this world, they have to yield the soul back, the spark of life, the all spark. And every morning when we arise from sleep, we say, My God, the soul you place and the shaman you place within me is the horror. It's pure. You've blown it into me. Okay, you guard it within me and eventually you're going to take it from me. Okay, it has to go back. It's like credit. You don't own it. It belongs. Hashem has given us something. How have we maintained it? How have we taken care of it? And so we have to return those things back. And so if we truly want to experience God's blessing, life, and goodness, not just superficially quoting the pages of the Machzor, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, then basically we have to make sure we don't misappropriate these things and we have to genuinely serve Hashem with joy. And I can tell you what, friends, you know, Looking outside the window of life, you know, things don't look too promising for the world right now. And I'm not a doom and gloom individual, right? Not one of those guys. 
But I do believe that Hashem is not going to let the world continue acting and running its course as it has been. And so everyone is experiencing something to a certain degree. Their comfort zone has been shaken up. And that is happening because Hashem wants the people to understand what is their purpose in this world. And so for many of us who acknowledge, and acknowledge the king of the universe, we have to consider how have we been using or approaching Hashem in not just good times, but also bad times. Because God told Israel, even when everything was good, you didn't serve me in joy. Now are you going to serve me in joy when things are bad? Psychologically, maybe not. Maybe you have to continue to go all the way to the bottom of the pit until you snap into reality. And so I would like to challenge each and every one of you who is maybe struggling serving Hashem with joy to try to engender that within you some way, somehow, to break through any ruach yush, spirit of despondency. Okay, because as we saw in Isaiah, God told the people, I'm going to place a deep sleep, a spirit of deep sleep upon you. Which meant that when it comes to studying a Torah, you're not going to be able to perceive and decipher. Why? Because you're blocked by Tuma. Tuma is, an, is a non-corporal, it's intangible. It's an energy, it's spiritual. But it's a very real thing that can impact people. So with that said, I would like to challenge everyone as we have, but a few weeks left here of the month of Elul, getting ready to go in to the new year. And we always have to read Kitavo right before the new year to get the curses out of the way. Most people start to go through a little bit more tribulations at this time. And if you've been going through some tribulation, Buh Hashem, give God the praise and honor. Rejoice in that, even though that may be a difficult thing. God is your strength. He's your salvation. He's the one that will restore all good things to you. And recognize that everything is meant to help develop your soul, help strengthen you in the purpose of what you were here for. And so, with that said, Chavarim, that's going to bring us to a close for our teaching on Parshat Kitavo. And once again, if our teachings here are a blessing to you and you'd like to uh, donate, you can find the links directly below the video description. We thank you for your financial support. Thank you for your prayers. And also, as we transition for the new year, um, a lot of people have emailed wondering what's going on with us. I do have a lot of things I'm involved in privately. Uh, so I'm not really sure 100% um, if the videos will be viable, meaning going forth how much I'm going to continue producing uh, right now, uh, just due to other private projects I'm involved in. Uh, so Bazar Hashem, we'll see how those things go. I'll keep everyone informed as well. And other for that, if you have any questions, you always feel free to drop me an email. I will get to those in the order that they come in. So until next time, Chavarim, Medigar of Avraham, Yitzach, and Yaakov. Bless you and your families. Shalom and Kol Torah.